Tate Chronicles now transmitting. Welcome to the Tate Chronicles on Healthcare Now Radio. And now, here's your host, Jim Tate. Good day, citizens of the free world, from border to border, coast to coast, and to all the ships at sea. I bring you a warm welcome. This is your correspondent, Jim Tate, and thank you for tuning into the Tate Chronicles. Join me as we cut through the fog that exists at the leading edge of healthcare delivery and technology. Our mission is simple. We're searching for beneficial disruption in healthcare from emerging technologies and trends. I'm really glad today my guest is Laura McCary. She's Senior Vice President at Camco Health Solutions. They provide a full suite of products and services to support healthcare providers. Uh, always good to have uh, somebody representing that voice of providers. Uh, everybody else has their voice on there right here for, for the providers. Laura is also the Executive Director at the Kansas Health Information Network. So, Laura, welcome to the Tate Chronicles. Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to spend some time with you today. Well, thank you. Um, I know your work at uh, both CAMCO and the Kansas Health Information Network has led you deeply into issues related to healthcare delivery, interoperability, technology, all those kind of things. I always am curious, uh, what brought you into the healthcare field? How did you uh, end up where you are? I think that probably the very first time that I became aware of the problems associated with uh, many different providers and professionals trying to coordinate care was when I was a high school special education teacher in Frankfort, Kansas. And I was responsible for the, the education of high school children that had very complex special needs. So many of them had doctors, um, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists. Um, they, many of them had behavioral health concerns, and so they would have a, a clinical therapist. And, and what we found was that all of those different individuals, while very well-meaning and, and caring, were not communicating with, with each other. And so consequently, sometimes the work that they did was actually, actually opposed to what another one of the therapists was doing with the child. And so it became clear to me that there needed to be a new way and a new system put into place that allowed professionals to be able to share the medical records with other medical professionals when they're serving the same patient. And so that was clear back in the early 80s that that took place. And really at that time, the technology didn't exist. Everything, you know, medical records were still on paper. So we did the best we could, which was we faxed information around and we tried to schedule conference calls, but still things got duplicated. Things got missed. Um, children actually didn't get all the services that they should have received. And so now if you fast forward um, almost, you know, 30 years, we still are in a situation where patients, you know, you and me and others, you know, when they go into the hospital, the hospital emergency room physician may not have all of the information that he or she needs to provide the best, the safest, and the most economical care because they don't have all of the medical records available to them, say, from that patient's primary care doctor or the patient's um, ENT. And, and so consequently, you know, if, if you look at where we were 30 years ago when I was a high school teacher in Frankfort, Kansas, trying to coordinate care for my high school students with special needs to where we are today, we still have much of that same problem existing. And so what we're going to talk about today is the efforts that have been underway in the area of interoperability to solve that problem. And for the last 15 years of my career, I've dedicated myself to trying to solve the problem of bringing all of the information to the point of care so that the doctor has all the information that he or she needs to provide the best care to the patient. Well, that is uh, a giant challenge for a lot of, uh, a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, the, the idea of a health record that can be accessed by uh, a provider at the right place at, at the right time is certainly the, I guess that's the holy grail that everybody's looking for. You, you mentioned that you uh, remember when the attempts at interoperability were, were based on being able to fax documents from one place to another. Well, my background goes back just a little, a little bit further than that, Laura. I, I was in, uh, involved in healthcare before we had fax machines. And so uh, 
and uh, when the fax machine came, we thought it was miraculous because uh, f frequently patients, and to this day, will show up at a specialist office, and they really don't even know why they're there. They just know that another physician sent them there. Uh, and, and so we can at least get some, maybe some information uh, faxed over. L let's kind of step all the way uh, back a, a, a few steps here. The, the idea of health information exchanges, um, I guess 10 or 15 years ago, they were called regional health information organizations, REOs. I'm not sure why the, why the name changed, but there are quite a few of them. They're made up of uh, groups of hospitals or, or, or possibly they are statewide. Tell me a little bit about the Kansas Health Information Network. Is that a statewide health information exchange? It is a statewide health information exchange. It was started in 2010 by the Kansas Medical Society and the Kansas Hospital Association. And those two organizations came together and really they put forward an idea that was a little bit different than what was being um, actually put in place across the rest of the country. The idea was that doctors and hospitals are really the organizations that create the, um, the medical records. And so consequently, doctors and hospital staff and administrators ought to be the people who assume responsibility for building and managing and governing the health information exchange and the data that's actually contained in the health information exchange. And so that was kind of a new uh, concept because at that time in 2010, many of the exchanges were being operated um, by the federal government or they were being operated by state government. And and uh, it was very rare to see doctors and hospitals saying it, it's our responsibility to actually make sure that the medical records that we've created for our patients are well managed and the best way to do that is for doctors and hospitals to be responsible for them. So I, I began working at the Kansas Health Information Network in 2010. It's a not-for-profit 501c3 owned by the people of Kansas and um, 10 years later, this next year will be our, our 10 year anniversary, uh, 10 years later we have almost all of the hospitals in Kansas connected and sharing data and that's quite, quite a few hospitals, about 126 hospitals hospitals across the state of Kansas. About 70% of all of our physician practices are connected and sharing data. Mm -hmm. All of our federally qualified health centers, um, community mental health centers. So we have been very successful with the idea of a provider-led health information exchange over the last 10 years. Here's my question. A, a, a practice may be connected. Have you had any trouble getting uh, private practices and providers to actually utilize the Health Information Network. Well, that's, that's a, an excellent yeah. question. That's a culture. That's a cultural shift there. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. It is an, an, an excellent question. And so, there's really two ways that providers access the Health Information Exchange, and 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 this is pretty common, not not just with with our exchange, but with most exchanges. There is a web-based portal that if you have a treatment relationship with a patient, then you would have a username and password to go into the web-based portal and search for that patient and be able to pull the information back from all of the different facilities that that patient's received care at. And so that's a pretty straightforward, easy, you know, kind of way to, mm -hmm. to get the information you need. But what we found was that as electronic medical record systems have been implemented um, across, you know, hospitals and practices and other, other provider organizations, doctors and nurses really don't want to have to leave their electronic medical record and go into another web-based portal. They want all of that information to be in one location. And so over the last few years, probably the last five or six years, we've been able to build the capacity to embed the health information exchange in the electronic medical record system. So now for most electronic medical records that are being used in the market today, the health information exchange data comes right into the electronic medical record and the doctor or nurse just clicks on uh, a tab that pulls up all of the information from all of the different places that the patients received care at. And what we found is that that improves the overall utilization of the exchange dramatically mm -hmm. because the doctor doesn't have to go log into another website to get that information. So, I, you know, you're, you're 
correct in that it does require a change in the way that doctors um, practice medicine and that nurses actually, you know, interact with patients. But it seems to be a change that is very beneficial because patients, as, as you mentioned before, oftentimes patients may not remember their full medical history. They may not remember the names of their medications. And, and having that information at the fingertips of the doctor or the nurse so that they can actually communicate with the patient and say, oh, I see that you, know, that you actually do have a prescription for a particular medication, sometimes is incredibly important information in caring for that patient. And, and so we found that, that those practices that do utilize the health information exchange, that their overall patient satisfaction scores related to, you know, when patients are asked, does my doctor know about my past medical history? In those cases where the health information is being used, those scores are very high because the doctors do know about the past medical history. Kind of a... Uh just if I can step into the technical side of things for just a minute. So when they pull down that data, is it coming down in an electronic format as one of those CCDA files that can actually be incorporated into a, a patient's database, codified problems and, and medications? Or is it like... It sure a, does. Okay. Yep. Uh, okay. It sure uh, does. Yeah. Uh, that's critical. Yeah, absolutely critical. So we've talked a little bit about how that information can come down. It, What's required on the provider, uh, it's probably easier on hospitals when they discharge a patient to upload a discharge summary to your health information network. What about at a provider's practice? What do they have to do if they have a clinical encounter with a patient? How do they get that data back up into the uh, health information network? Well, that's, that's also an excellent question, and there's not one single answer. It's really um, very uh, based upon the electronic medical record system that the practice or the hospital is using. And each one of the electronic medical record systems that's out there uh, has a little bit different flavor of how they actually transport data to health information exchanges. But in general, they sort of fall into um, three different categories. So some of the um, EMR vendors transport data off of traditional what are called HL7 V2 data feeds. And so in, in that case, what happens is our project managers, who are very skilled in building these interfaces, work with the practice and the electronic medical record vendor, and they actually build a feed that says, anytime there's a new diagnosis, send it to the health information exchange, or anytime there's a new medication, or anytime there's new lab results. And so you build these feeds that send the data real time, and it's automatic. The, it all happens behind the scenes. The doctor or the nurse doesn't have any idea that, that, you know, it's even happening. So there's no burden associated with it. It's just happening automatically. As soon as they enter a new diagnosis of diabetes into the patient's chart, it's automatically being sent to the exchange. Hmm. And within really a matter of minutes, it's available to anybody else that is um, caring for that patient. So that's sort of the first flavor. Sure. The second flavor the second flavor really is that a, a, a CCD or a continuity of care document or a consolidated CDA, these are all names for a document that the electronic medical record system creates that includes all of the basic and important information about what happened with the patient in that particular visit. So the consolidated CDA is actually created by the electronic medical record system. And, and, and folks may have actually seen these consolidated CDAs because oftentimes this is the information that's provided to the patient at the conclusion of the visit or this is the information that's sent to the patient portal that a patient may have. But this consolidated CDA then can automatically be sent to the health information exchange. So for many, many electronic medical record uh, vendors, that's the way they transport data, is the consolidated CDA is actually created at the conclusion of the patient visit, and it's automatically transferred to the health information exchange through an interface that we've built. And so that's sort of the second flavor. And then the third flavor is what we call a point-to-point -point connection, where the data is not actually coming into the health information exchange. We actually are going out and just querying another facility to say, do you have any information on this patient? 
and then that facility will return just the information for that patient, and then we put it together into a consolidated view for the doctor or the nurse or the end user. So those are really the three ways that data is transported between a practice or a hospital and a health information exchange. So that's the uh, discrete uh, data, data, so to speak. What about large files, uh, radiology, PET scans, CT scans, those DICOM images? Uh, how could somebody access those? Are they, well, we do uh, not, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, we, we do not currently exchange images in, in our health information exchange. Uh, and we have in the past had the capability to exchange images and, and really we found that it wasn't heavily utilized. And so what, we, what our provider said to us was that what was most important to them was to get the report from the radiologist and that that was what was most valuable and that that's what they really wanted to have available in the health information exchange. And so um, in 2016, we discontinued our image exchange pilot because it, the, the images just were not being accessed at the level that we had anticipated that they would. And, and the feedback from all of our providers was that it's just not necessary for most of the doctors uh, to actually have the image. What they really needed was the report from the radiologist. So that's where we are today. Um, there are image exchange products that are available in the market, and we're always looking to see if there's a, a growing need, you know, from our customers for image exchange. Um, but right now, today, we don't currently exchange the images themselves, just the reports. You know, and, and that makes to total sense. Uh, those images can be very, very large, take a lot of storage, take a long time to transmit, and just from a workflow perspective, uh, many specialists uh, certainly want, a, uh, be, want to be looking at an image that is as recent as possible. There's a dynamic process uh, go, going on there. Laura, with uh, interoperability, which uh, really seems to be your, your passion uh, in, in these things, uh, to me, there's about four or five different areas. I'd like to kind of pick them apart a little bit. Uh, part of it, uh, we needed the, the technology. And uh, we, uh, we have the internet. We have the CCDA type files that have been, you know, that ha have become the, the standard. Uh, and any certified electronic health record uh, really uh, for years, and uh, the, the most recent version of that certified technology requires the most recent version of the CCDA to be exported as well as imported EHR and, and reconciled. So we, we have the technology. Is, do you see that there are any, any big things going forward in technology, or do we have the plumbing in place that we need for interoperability? Well, I, I think that this, this is going to be a, a, a very long, really, work in progress for us to get the plumbing in place that's going to be necessary. And I, and I think I always remind people that it's important to remember that, you know, the first cell phones became available in, you know, the mid-1970s. And, and really, in, you know, until, you know, you know, about 2010, really most of us didn't really use cell phones on a regular basis. But they've been available now for almost 40 years, and the ability to actually you know, uh, use those cell phones has increased over time as the network, you know, the cell phone networks have been built out and the capabilities of the cell phones have improved. And you have to give some thought to interoperability of electronic medical records in the same vein. Um, really, you know, we just started 10 years ago in this process of building electronic medical records and then building the network that connects those electronic medical records together, which of course is the health information exchange. So we're 10 years into this work. There may be a few organizations that have been doing it a slightly a, a bit longer, but in general, we're about 10 years into this work. And we are seeing significant progress in terms of uh, building out the network to connect all the electronic medical record systems and also improving the capabilities. But we still have a long way to go. And, and if, if any of you um, that are listening have ever, you know, observed the, um, you know, the cable companies laying cable to your house, it, it's not quite as complicated 
to build these interfaces and to connect these um, electronic medical record systems is actually digging a trench and, build, and you know, laying in the pipes and, and running the cable through the pipes, but it is still pretty complicated. And, and as you alluded to, you've got um, to be able to actually develop those VPNs, the virtual private networks in the, in, you know, the internet um, sphere, and then actually move the data across those. And, and so it is something that's going to take really years for us to build out, but you need to also think about it just like the cell phone networks that have been put into place. This is a utility that we're building, and we will continue to build this utility ongoing because, you know, connections will break and they'll need to be repaired, or new technology will emerge um, and we'll need to upgrade to the new technology. So we will be building this, this connectivity for the next you know, 15 or 20 years before we really see full interconnectivity across the entire nation. But I will say things are, things are moving, moving along, so I think that's very positive. You know, th th that's really helpful to me, Laura, to, to view it as a utility being built Built and compared it to uh, cable rollout or even internet rollout, where at first we used dial-up internet access. It was kind of miraculous, but it was so slow. And, and so uh, uh, with that comparison, it's easy to see a trajectory that's being in place because uh, certainly the technology is like utilities being built. Um, another part of interoperability that always interests me is policy. Uh, I, I live in North Carolina, and so for uh, Medicaid providers, there is legislation that's already passed here that mandates that if a, uh, a provider sees a Medicaid patient, they have to upload one of those CCDAs to the what's called NC Connects, the, the state HIE, or they don't receive payment. It's a 100% penalty. Now, it's, that's kind of being uh, uh, put in over a few years, and, and it's been delayed some. And actually, the most recent deadline is tomorrow night at midnight, and I'm sure the governor is going <laughs> to sign an extension. But that's the part of interoperability uh, that has to do with policy and this being mandated. Do you see more of those mandates on a state-by-state -state basis to participate in these exchange networks? Gosh, you know, I, I, each one of our states um, is, is so different, and, you know, the politics in each state change on a regular basis. And so I think that, um, you know, from the perspective of Medicaid and really Medicare as well, you know, what you really want to do is provide the very best and safest care for the patient. And, and consequently, if the doctor who's treating the patient you know, doesn't have current medical records, or if the patient can't remember their medical history, that, that's just simply not possible. The, the best and safest care isn't being provided if those medical records aren't available. So I can understand the reason that Medicaid agencies would do that because they're really looking out for the safety of the patients. But, but I, I, certainly, I certainly see a great deal of variability across the nation in terms of the way states are engaged in, in this work. So, so I, I don't know that I'm qualified to comment, but, but, but mm -hmm. I, I'm sure we'll see, you know, wide variability across the nation in terms of states really, you know, demanding the safest and most effective care for their patients, and that could mean mandating participation in health information exchange. Well, and it's, it's kind of interesting how um, under the Meaningful Use Program, which uh, was a still in effect for, for, for Medicaid providers, but attempt by the federal government, a fairly successful attempt to incentivize the adoption of electronic health, or, uh, health record technology. Uh, and so there was a lot of incentives there. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. We're starting to see, uh, again, not just necessarily incentives, but in, in some states really mandate because of those entities that are paying for the health care, and I guess uh, Medicare is the number one payer in the United States, whoever controls the purse strings can kind of uh, call the tune, as they say. So starting to see some of that. It's kind of fascinating. Um, we only have about two or three more minutes, so let me pop in a couple more quick questions about these interoperability aspects. Part of it has to do with culture, because until, as you say, 10 years ago, there was no such thing as interoperability. Providers were not uh, being trained. Uh, it was, you know, a patient's in front of me, uh, what's their main complaint, how do I address it? 
and so you didn't have data coming in from other sources. So we're also going through this trajectory of a cultural shift among providers uh, looking for data coming from uh, outside the room that they're in, actually. That seems to be uh, a pretty, pretty, pretty large cultural shift that's taking place over a you know, one or two decade period of time, as, as well as comfort with, with technology. So there seems to be a lot more comfort with, with the technology. Used to be a lot of, uh, you know, providers uh, who didn't like to have to use a computer in a room. Uh, but I don't hear those, uh, that pushback nearly as much as, as I used to. I mean, what are your thoughts on that, the, the cultural aspects of interoperability? Well, you know, I work with doctors really all over all over the nation, and I I do think that we probably still have about 20% of the physicians uh, across the nation, particularly in rural areas, that that do not have electronic health record systems. Many of those doctors are you know doctors that are sort of at the end of their career, and and doctors that um, really haven't embraced uh, the, the use of technology in their practices. So, so one of the things, obviously, that's happening is, you know, as this becomes more commonplace, doctors are, sort, you know, beginning to retire that have been those that have said that they really are, are not interested in, in, in actually implementing an electronic health record system. But, but I will say, and I agree with you, this is becoming the standard of care to have an electronic medical record system. Absolutely. And, and so, you know, medical malpractice insurance companies are looking closely at whether or not a doctor has an electronic medical record system because it does cause the doctors to be safer and it causes the patients to get more efficient and, and you know, more uh, complete care. The electronic medical record systems can alert the doctor if a patient has you know, is missing a, prevent a preventive screening that they may need, for example, a breast cancer screening. Um, one of the, the biggest areas that uh, medical malpractice insurance companies find that they have claims in is failure to diagnose breast cancer. And, and oftentimes that's because the patient has not gotten her breast cancer screening and, and perhaps the doctor has failed to realize because it wasn't, you know, a prompt from the electronic medical record system that, that the, the, the woman needed that breast cancer screening. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I would just say that, that, you know, everything takes time. Uh, and, and the culture will slowly change, and that's really what we're seeing is that 10 years ago, really very few doctors and hospitals had electronic medical record systems, much less participated in health information exchange. Fast forward, you know, to where we are now, really seeing that that's down to only about 20% of doctors not having an electronic medical record system in almost all hospitals. I haven't seen the most recent statistics, but, you know, we're at like 95% of all hospitals have electronic medical record systems. And we're seeing increasing um, participation in health information exchange and interoperability. So another 10 years from now, um, you know, Jim, I think that we will, we will be having conversations really not so much about the building of the utility any longer, you know, because that'll be, you know, well underway, but really how do we, how do we take what we've built and really make it meaningful in the care of patients and in reducing the, you know, the administrative burden on our doctors who, you know, often are, are dealing with an enormous amount of, of paperwork and, and, and documentation. So I'm hopeful that the next 10 years will be less about, you know, building the pipes and more about how do we really use the data mm -hmm. that we've obtained um, and how do we make it really be so it's valuable to the care of patients. And, and so that's really my hope for the next 10 years. Laura, we're, time has flown by on us, and that is uh, a hopeful note, as always, a good place to end. And so uh, to my audience, thanks for joining me on this episode of the Tate Chronicles. I offer a special salute to my guest, Laura McCrary. Laura, thanks for coming aboard today. Thank you very, very much. You can find more information on this show's program page at healthcarenowradio.com. Until we meet again, here's wishing you smooth sailing and safe harbors. Tape Chronicles transmission ending now.